Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and uh, once again it is time for the Q&A, so let me get my hat on, and uh, let's go ahead and get this started. Alright, first question. Hey Jason, why should novice uh, slash early intermediate lifters do pause work only for their upper body presses, but non-pause squats in order to use a stretch reflex? Uh, I know novices have to learn to use a stretch reflex during the squat, but I also remember you saying that pause squats are way superior for developing strength and power from the bottom. Uh, the lift may carry over uh, more to regular squats than regular squats themselves do. Yeah, uh, let's talk about that for a bit. Honestly, I don't think we need to be that dogmatic about it. Yeah, I think novice lifters need to never ever do touch and go presses. And the reason for that is because they end up shortchanging their development because they start chasing their ego, they start bouncing it. And if they, they don't always understand <laughs> what we mean by just touching the chest. They'll, they'll end up bouncing it if you're not careful. And by bouncing it, they end up with less chest development. These are the same guys who run around screaming that the bench press is not an amazing chest builder. Anyone who tells you that the bench press is not an amazing uh, chest builder actually doesn't know how to bench press. That's the problem. And by forcing them to pause for a one count on their chest on every single rep for all their presses, including their overhead press, you force them to use their chest on a lift that's supposed to be chest dominant. Uh, and it forces them to stop cheating on it, trying to chase ego. And so, yeah, they end up with a lot better chest development. Now, with the pause squat, you know what? Honestly, the reason I had originally said, yeah, I have them learn to use a stretch reflex early was on my novice program. I was concerned about getting people to those numbers quickly, uh, getting them up to that 315 squat for reps. Uh, but, you know, truth be told, if we're going to seek both strength and overall size, they might be better off learning to just pause squat because you know what? A lot of them will learn to bounce it incorrectly out of the bottom also. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with them doing pause squats. You know, in the long term, a novice who's doing pause squats exclusively, uh, he might end up with better overall strength and development anyways. Uh, particularly if he's always going to be squatting without um, wraps, without uh, knee sleeves, things like that probably advantageous. You know, the guys who don't ever really need to do a lot of pause squatting are oftentimes those guys who use wraps, those guys who use sleeves, because they don't develop that same weakness out of the bottom. Uh, and IPF guys can argue all they want about how their sleeves don't add much, but um, you have them take the sleeves off and see if they can pause squat, and then you'll see the big difference in how much those <laughs> knee sleeves really, really matter. Uh, but for guys who are never going to use sleeves, never going to use wraps, which is going to be most people who aren't going to compete in powerlifting, uh, the pause squat's probably better because it will build overall better strength in the squat. It will probably help them uh, develop better glutes, uh, possibly better quads, uh, and all of that. So yeah, there could be advantages to just having the novice lifter do pause squats as well. So we don't need to be dogmatic about it. And people need to understand that there's a big difference between training for overall size and strength versus training for a sports-specific uh, endeavor. And there's a big difference even in training for people in the long term uh, who are going to go compete with, with knee sleeves on tight knee sleeves versus just overall development and strength. Uh, so big difference there. And uh, yeah, pause squats are probably fine for the novice. In fact, I might even go back that direction again. Uh, but if I do, I might need to slightly lower the strength standards. Jason, I think I have, sorry, let me get to the next question here. Jason, I think I have pretty much ruled out squats uh, uh, out of my training uh, with both hip flexors constantly giving me hell and now my knees just starting to act up. I think it's time to quit the squats. I've been killing them for six years and I want to maintain their size if possible. Is there anything I can do to possibly retain the muscle I've gained in my quads? Um, you know what, if you say you've been killing it in the squat, maybe it's time to just deload your squat for a while. Maybe it's time to just drop to a, l a lighter weight on your squat and do that for a few months and see if your hip flexors and everything heal up. Uh, figure out what's going on with your knees. Now, what I'm going to state up front, talking about knee pain, I'm worried that you're using wraps or sleeves. If you're using knee wraps or knee sleeves in your training, that's very possibly why your knees are, are uh, hurting now and it will shift your biomechanics in general. Uh, so what I would say is there could be things going on with your squat there. Now, if you're using those things, your knee damage is probably permanent. I uh, hate to have to tell people that who've been using wraps and sleeves and everything for years. But if that's what's causing your knee pain, you're pretty well screwed. Uh, you've probably damaged your knees, uh, the cartilage in there, and it might be permanent damage. That's just the risk you take when you use dangerous devices like that to lift more weight. 
Uh, it's just the reality of it. Now, as far as the hips and everything go, I also have to ask, what sort of shoes are you wearing? Go over and go lighter for a while and get some elevated heels, some weightlifting shoes, some squat shoes, something like that. And see if that makes the hip pain go away over the course of several months when you back the weight down. Those are options. Now, failing that, uh, quad size isn't hard to, to maintain on other lifts, meaning you don't even necessarily need quad specific lifts. A lot of guys are down below saying, well, you could try leg presses, you could try this, you could try that. But uh, if his hips and knees are hurting him on squats, leg presses might not be much better um, as far as that goes. You could try it, you could try leg presses. I certainly wouldn't reject that if you're wanting to maintain size in your quads, but you know what? Guys, remember I used to do Bulgarian style squatting or I was doing accumulation work on squatting where I was doing 30 sets of squats a week. Um, you guys know I've done extremely high frequency squats uh, for years. I quit squatting. I haven't done a squat in over a year. I probably haven't done a squat in a year and a half. My quads are still the same size. Why? Because I deadlift a lot. I deadlift very frequently. I deadlift heavy. Uh, and even stuff like push presses has helped. Push presses actually develop the quads. Deadlifts develop the quads. And even though I'm not hitting the quads as hard as I did with the squatting, I find that uh, as an older, more advanced lifter, I'm able to maintain the size of my legs just fine using the deadlift and uh, push press. Even though I don't always use the push press all the time, I do strict press uh, through certain phases also. I find that's more than adequate for maintaining uh, my quad size once they're already developed. Wouldn't be my first choice for developing them, but it certainly seems acceptable for maintaining them. Uh, and that's the name of the game there for you. All right, next question. Hello, Jason, longtime follower. Uh, would you, what would you recommend to a person who has been lifting continually for seven or more years, is into the advanced stages of training if their goal was uh, continued hypertrophy? continual progress. Could you simply run your linear periodization hypertrophy program forever? Or will the three sets of five at 85% intensity always bury them? Uh, I do not believe I can hit the three sets of five reps at 85% intensity because I will not have progressed enough to do more than a single set. Uh, what adjustments can be made to make the program better for them? All right, man, we get into the topic of advanced lifters and that's the simple reality of it. Novices can push higher percentages of their one rep max. They can do higher volumes at given percentage of their one rep max. The more advanced you get, the more difficult it becomes to do that because you're stronger. You're able to generate much, much, much higher workloads in any given set. Um, and so therefore it's a little more difficult to recover from your actual efforts of work. Or in this case, yeah, you can take a lot of people who they started at the 85%. Meaning, by the time these lifters get to that, because this periodization program is for people who are not advanced, haven't been training seven years, they're actually making reasonable gains in every block. So what happens is that 85% was 85% for them at the start of it. And you're something like 9, 10, or yeah, is it how many weeks in? I would have to relook at my program there because I've got several of them. But you're probably 9 or 10 weeks into the program when you hit that. Well, that's nine or 10 weeks of progress for someone who's not an advanced lifter. That 85% is not a true 85%. And that's what you need to understand. For the advanced lifter, I might consider uh, lowering everything three to 5%. Meaning since you're not going to advance as much stage to stage, in fact, you're gonna advance very, very little. When you're an advanced lifter, you don't make a lot of progress per month. You oftentimes don't make much progress per year. Like sometimes for the advanced lifter, your yearly progress, and this pisses advanced guys off, is going to be what sometimes a novice lifter does in the first month. In a single month, a novice lifter can sometimes make more progress than an advanced lifter makes in a year. That's reality. So what I would say is drop all those things somewhere between 3 and 5%. When you test out for your maxes to know where you're at, when you go to run the program, test it all out. And rather than run the program as written, you could drop those percentages week to week somewhere between three and 5%. So that three sets of five doesn't actually have to be at 85%. You could run it somewhere between 80 and 82%. And that little subtle difference, particularly if you drop it down to 80%, you'll be able to do three sets of five with 80% of your original max. But you've got to remember the, uh, say an intermediate or late novice lifter running this program 
that's not 85% for them when they get to it. It was 85% when they started three blocks ago, three blocks ago in the training. But when they get there, uh, they've already made progress. They've gotten bigger. They've gotten stronger. So it's actually probably closer to 80% uh, to 82% of their max anyways. So treat it as such for you as an advanced lifter because you know that you don't make the same progress they do in every block, nowhere near. So honestly, you're looking to make just a little bit of progress throughout the year, continual progress. And so uh, drop the percentages accordingly in the program because it's geared for people who are making faster progress in advance. And that's why the percentages are not true percentages when you actually get them. They're the percentages at the start of week one. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.